he opens this subject up by telling man that he is condemned in the first seven verses. For example, you were dead in your trespasses and sin or sins. And he talks about the former life of the world in verse 2 and the angelic conflict. That's verse 2. He goes back to the subject of the former life before you were saved and how you lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind and were by nature children of wrath. 13 judicial charges information of Adam set upon the human race. In verse 4, he switches the subject to the solution of Adamic sin. God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions of Adam's sin, made us alive together with Christ. And notice the, the parentheses. He paraphrases. Watch this now. That's really important. This little parenthesis here is really important to verses 8 and 9. Notice where we were, the first three verses, a condition of bondage through Adam's sin, in, born into the slave market of sin. How do we get out of it? You're born into it. How do you get out of the slave market of sin? Adam's sin. Verses 4 and 5, he explains that. In verse, in verse 4, and then verse 5 and 6, he says, uh, for by grace you are saved, comma, and raised us up with him. Notice these are positional truths. Made us alive together with Christ. Raised us up with him. Resurrected the, the living life raised us up with him, and seated us. Notice those three positional truths. <laughs> Phase one, two, and three. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches. When you look at the six stages of grace and you go from saving grace to logistical grace to growing grace to suffering grace to dying grace, you come to surpassing grace, which he just mentioned, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> that was sentence one. The parentheses of verse 5, when he changed the subject to the solution of Adamic sin, being born into the slave market of sin, and how you cannot get out of that on your own. Then he turns the subject to how you get out, and he talks. In four verses, he talks a lot of theology. I mean, th there are, there's a lot of theology in verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. <clears throat> Then he returns to the parentheses of verses, verse 5. <clears throat> Here's verse 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no man should boast. Then he comes to verse 10 and wraps it up. For we are his workmanship, we being the believer of verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, where he introduced the subject and taught the theology of the gospel in verses 8 and 9. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. <laughs> that we are his work created in Christ Jesus for divine production or good works, divine production, workmanship created for divine production, which God prepared beforehand, that's the eternal life conference, that we should walk in them. That we should walk in what? Divine production. The good works that God has laid out for us in the Christian life 
in the church age. It's a pretty powerful. Those 10 verses are just enormous theology in 10 verses. We're looking at verse 8 and 9, saved by grace. That was the key to the parentheses as he changed the subject from Adam's sin, born in the slave market of sin, to how you get out. And the two key characteristics of God was mercy and love. Agreed? Mercy and love. Uh, through the propitious work, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. And I mean, you could teach a long time on these 10 verses. I mean, a long time. The theology of these verses to the church age are just enormous. One day I'll come back and do that with you. It will be a wonderful study for you. So let's stop here and have a word of prayer. And we'll take a look at why saving grace is so important, uh, uh, so important for us. Saving grace, salvation. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin, mental attitude types, sins of the tongue overt should be confessed through your priesthood as you begin to study the word of God this morning. The Holy Spirit will be the great teacher for your soul. His job is to teach and recall. Uh, that whole operation on his part is the inhale, exhale on our part. That's a marvelous idea. So I give you a moment. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How thankful we are this morning, Father, for these who have come our way and set in freedom in America. I know many of our brothers and sisters around the world don't have that privilege that we have. And uh, the church should be in deep prayer that we never lose it. It gives us the sense, the sense of freedom to go everywhere. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. A greater freedom than the one we talk of, national freedom. For even if the nation is not a free nation, we are still free people in Christ. We must never forget that, and we must pray for that for our brothers and sisters around the world, that they never lose the sense of their freedom in Christ, even though they might be uh, in a, a terrible situation in a nation like the early church was with Rome and Israel. I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would teach us some great truths about Paul's insight to being saved by grace out of Ephesians 2, 8, 9. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're, if you're looking up to a place to put your studies recently, you should have you should keep this in your category called soteriology, which is a study of salvation, which we've been in for a few studies. We call this soteriology in theology. This is one of the great doctrines of the Christian church. You see, you could understand how much the devil fights it and argues against it because it is one of the great, great, great doctrines of the Christian church. It was taught by Paul in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 in a marvelous way of heavy theology. Peter says, when you study Paul like in the book of Ephesians, you've got to have your spiritual hat on, 2 Peter 3, 16. And you'll certainly need it. Even in something as simple as grace salvation, he's talking the theology of it in Ephesians. He's talking the theology of it. The theology behind soteriology is pretty deep. It's not for baby believers, but it is for advanced believers to understand the theology of saving grace. And so Paul begins his subject by he takes this context and puts it in three sentences in the Greek language. It's not so in the English Bible, but it is so in the Greek Bible. So it's important that you take a look at that. Whenever you see a writer pause in the middle of a sentence and do a parenthesis, it's well worth noting. 
And the English Bible did it as well as good. They did it. <laughs> In the Greek Bible, you wouldn't see that. You would understand it from the Greek grammar. But in the English, they put it in there so you could not miss this idea that Paul was saying. That's really important to our study. It's really important that you understand that Paul took the context of the theology of salvation and broke it into three Greek sentences. And uh, there's a lot of information there, a lot. But what I'm going to focus on was what he focused on in those 10 verses. He parenthesized the part of the second chapter as he introduced the solution to being born in the slave market of Adam's sin. As he introduced it in 4 5, he parentheses in, in, five, in 4, in 5, he parentheses, and then came back in 8 and 9 with a separate verse, with a separate sentence, and just nailed it. I mean, it is anybody that gets into grace, they learn Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I mean, the Holy Spirit will teach you so quick, it will make your head spin. How quick he will teach that verse to you. He'll teach those two verses. You don't even have to spend any time memorizing it. He just locks it in. It's a, it's a, it's a most amazing thing. And I don't care who, once you get grace-oriented, he'll pound I mean, in a split second, he'll record that in your soul, and you'll remember that verse. There's two verses, but they flow together so well, and you learn them so quick. Um, it's kind of like that John 3.16. It's, it's a long verse, but nobody has difficult memorizing it. The Holy Spirit just goes like, clicks it in. Well, I want you to see a couple things about the second, the parentheses of 2.5. I put it on your paper. The writer says, for by grace, the word you is plural. That's Southern, y'all. That's plural. By grace, you all have been saved. What you cannot see in the English, and that's too bad. This is a perfect paraphrastic phrase. The perfect paraphrastic, the perfect tense is so powerful when it's used, that most of the time it swallows up the finite verb. Back in my day when I took English, we called them helping verbs. <laughs> you remember those? I don't know. I don't know what they call them now. <clears throat> but they're called a finite verb in the Greek, and we call them main verbs. A finite verb is a main verb. You don't even see it. For example, it is... It is the word aimi. Aimi makes is part is the main verb. Aimi. You, you don't even see it. It is swallowed up by the power of the perfect tense. See, when it when it says, by grace you have been saved, have been saved is the perfect tense. You don't even see the word you are. And the word, the the finite verb which makes this a paraphrastic phrase, a perfect paraphrastic. The power of a perfect tense just swallows it up. And that's unfortunate in the English because you can't see it. There is actually the words you are having been seeing it don't it don't make it don't make much good sense. You are having been saved. But in the paraphrastic idea, it's very powerful. Now, the, the main verb or the finite verb, you are, which you cannot see, is a present active indicative, second person plural. And it's unidentifiable in the English, but it's very powerful in the Greek. And I'll come back to it. I just want you to see that sometimes something really important, a main verb, is swallowed up by the power of something else in a, in a sentence. And the, in the English, they don't know how to do that without it seeming odd. But it's a very, it's what the finite verb, which is a present active indicative second person plural, is what makes that a paraphrastic. Without it, you don't have that. You don't have a paraphrastic. 
you just have a perfect. But the power of a perfect tense can swallow up a finite verb. So, for by grace you have been saved, perfect paraphrastic with the I, me, present active, indicative, second person, plural. You have been, and then you have the word saved, which is a perfect passive participle, nominative, plural, masculine. Now, let me tell you what the writer did in the Greek language. You can, once you know this, you can kind of see it. He built a bridge. He talked about how you're born in the first three verses. He talked about how every human being is born in the slave market of Adam, sin, and there's no way out. Humanly speaking, humanly possible, there's no human possible way to get out. So in verse 4 and 5, he talks about God's eternal plan of how to get out of the slave market through his son, Jesus Christ. It's going to require his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And they're all going to be important to you, not only in the time of your salvation, but in the future of it. As he talks about positional truths. Then what he does, he stops in the middle of it and builds a bridge. It's a grammatical bridge from verse 2 to verses 8 and 9. It's a bridge. It's one bridge. Now, I want to show you the bridge. Look at verse 8. I want to show you the bridge. For by grace you've been saved. Now, watch this. Watch, here's the bridge. It's a perfect paraphrastic. This is verse 8 now. It is I me, present active addictive, second person plural, along with sozo, perfect passive participle, nominative plural masculine. You see the same bridge? You see it in verse 5? It's the same bridge. That's, what, that's a bridge. Do, do you see that? See, they're identical. Verse 5 and verse 8 are identical. That's called a grammatical bridge. That's just exactly what Paul has just done. Now, I don't know. You could see that in the English. Because you look at the technical, it's got IME, present active addictive, second person plural, plus sozo, perfect passive participle, now the plural masculine. They're identical. It's one bridge. It's a grammatical bridge of theology. Paul is a master of this stuff. It's my hope that when you, I can explain it simple enough to you for you to appreciate what Paul just did. There's no way you can see that apart from the language. There's no way. But once you see what it is in the Greek, you can see the identical of it in it. It's a bridge. It's built, it's one bridge. Okay. I want you to say it because he's, he's, he's not making a mistake here. He's doing it deliberately. He's an engineer, and he built a bridge, a theological engineer, and he built a bridge. It's the same bridge. Verse 5 and verse 8, same bridge, isn't it? All right. I can only teach it. I can't make you understand it nor believe it. But I'm trying to explain it as simple as I know how, though. Now look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. Again, notice the perfect touch has swallowed up the finite verb. It's just swallowed it up. It is such a strong, it is so strong, it just swallows up stuff like that. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God. I am saved by grace through faith. And that not of myself or yourselves. It's a gift of whom? God. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's not do you. D-U-E. But he gives it to you. 
as a what? Gift. Not wages. Not wages. Not work and not wages. It's a gift because it's grace. It is totally dependent on the one who's giving it, not on the one who's receiving it. All the cost, because it's a gift, all the cost is carried by the one who's given it. That's a perfect, powerful idea, and Paul's just stated about as clear as it can be stated. Let's look at three ideas. Let's look at three ideas about the doctrine of saving grace taught by Paul as he built a bridge from verse 5 to verse 8 and 9. Point number one, by connect, connecting the parentheses of Ephesians 2.5 to the theology of Ephesians 2.8 and 9, here's what Paul has done that you must get. Here's what Paul wants you to get. Paul established the scriptural assurance of every church age believer's eternal grace salvation. That's that perfect paraphrastic of salvation. In Hebrews 5, 9, the writer of Hebrews wrote, having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. You see, salvation is eternal. It's not based on you, your character or merit getting it, nor your character and merit, merit keeping it. It is a gift, and it's an eternal gift. It's a gift, and it's an eternal gift. Romans 3.24, being justified, that's brought legally into the presence of God, being justified as a gift by his grace, you see, look, justification is a gift. We talk about the 50 things you receive at salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. They're gifts. It's the gift of salvation and all that gift pertains to. Justification as a gift by his grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. This was decreed at the Apostolic Church Conference of Acts 15. They wrote in Acts 15, 11 in the decree, we, the Jews, believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way as they are also. Or we, the Gentiles, believe that we're saved just like the Jews. How was that? How, how were they both saved, Paul? Through grace. Through grace. We believe that we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's saving grace. Saving grace. Note that Paul put saved, sozo, in verse 5 and verse 8 and 9 of our passage in a perfect paraphrastic identically. He built a bridge on the subject of the theology of grace salvation. Note that the main verb, or what we call the finite verb, imi, and a verb of absolute status quo, verb of existence, in both regards, are present active indicative, second person plural. What is Paul trying to tell us theologically? The present tense teaches continuous, something that is continuous or always. The idea that Paul is pushing by the present tense, that you are saved continuously and always. You are continuously saved. He didn't put it in the passive voice. He put it in the active voice. You are. The moment you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, you are saved. And from that point, forever you are saved because you're saved by grace and it's a gift. It's not based on your merit. 
It's a, grace is 100% God and 0% man. There's nothing in the character of the object worthy to what God's doing. Um, the worth is in the propitious work of Christ on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The worth is in the son for God to save you mercifully by grace. So that's important. We have, an, we have the finite verb, which is a main verb, which is in the present tense, in the indicative mood. This is a present reality. Once you are saved, you're saved by grace. It's a gift. That salvation begins, and it goes forever. That's going to tell you by the perfect tense. The perfect tense it's a perfect passive participle. Iemi makes it paraphrasty. The perfect tense, the perfect tense means that you were saved in the past were the results that you will always be saved in the presence with perfect results. In other words, saved in the past results that you have perfect results, completed results, finished results. That's a perfect tense. Saved in the past results, you'll always be saved. The work that got you saved then is the work that keeps you saved always because you're saved by grace, the character of God, not the character of man. You're, you're saved through your faith, not meritorious thinking. And the object of that is what has the power to save you. Romans 1.16 the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And therefore, it's through faith that grace works as a gift. What a wonderful idea of the theology of saving grace. Saved in the past or the result that you will always, present tense, be saved now and forever through faith. Through faith. It's a gift. When God gives it to you, he doesn't take it back. You can't give it back. It is yours, whether you have appreciation for it, for it or not. You do understand that. The perfect tense says it's forever. Once received, it's forever. The present tense, active voice, says at that present tense, that's going to continue, and the perfect tense says God's grace as a gift is forever. How wonderfully put by Paul. Now, what's interesting is the perfect tense. When we get to the perfect tense of being saved, it's a passive voice. It means the subject is receiving the action. This is a powerful idea of sozo because it means that every church age believer enters into a finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross by grace, and at the moment he believes. It's not something he does, it's something God does for him. He is being saved. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power's in the gospel to save you, and he begins that process in your life of saving you, saving you. You don't save yourself. You don't keep yourself saved. He does that. John, the 10th chapter, verses 28 through 30, he says, in the hands illustration, you're in the hands of Christ. The point of salvation, you're in the hands of Christ, who is in the hands of God. You're secured forever because of that. Don't let anybody lie to you about this subject. Don't let anybody lie to you about this subject because you have the proof in the pudding. I'm giving it to you in Ephesians 2, 5, 8, 9. The passive voice. The perfect passive. When you go to John 19, 30, 
I'm going to show you wh where Paul is getting his information. When you go to John 19.30, you have Jesus on the cross, and he says, it is finished. The Thaliestai. He says, it's finished. Look what he did. He put it in the perfect tense. God put that statement in the perfect tense. Perfect passive indicative of the finished work. That work was finished from that point forever. When you're saved, you enter into, the moment you believe the gospel, you enter into a finished product in Christ. You understand that? That's the power of the perfect tense. The perfect tense that Paul is using in verse 5 and verse 8 comes out of John 1930. So there are three things that are important for us to walk away with as ambassadors for Christ. You've got to have the correct message, which is the gospel. Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. You've got to have the correct mechanics. How am I saved, Ron? Romans 1, 16. When you believe the gospel, the, the gospel is the power of God to save those who believe. The mechanics is not in you. It's in the gospel. The mechanics to save you is not in you. It's in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to everyone who believes. It saves those who believe. The power to save you is not in you. It's in the gospel. What you do is not meritorious thinking. <clears throat> and the object, gospel, which is Christ dies according to the scriptures, buried, according, raised according to the scripture, is the power to save you. And the means of salvation is the third part that's important to the message of salvation. The means of salvation, you're saved by grace through faith. It is a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift. It's not works. It's a gift. Point number two in the theology of saving grace. Because salvation is by means of grace through faith, it is a gift. Get that down in your head. It's not works. It's a gift. You don't work to get it. You don't work to keep it. You can't lose it because it's a gift. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. See that? Not of who? Not of yourselves. Not of yourself. It is a gift. Now, here's what Paul did. It's really interesting. See the word to Doron. The, the, see that word to? Do right, I put it in bold print. The T-O is a definite article in the Greek language. The gift. The gift. <clears throat> this is an unusual word that Paul used here. It's doron. Charisma is the normal word of the theology that Paul would use. Charisma, the word grace, the results of grace. I think I wrote it on your paper someplace. Yeah. It's not of yourself, it is a gift. I'll come back to that in a moment. From God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Now, I want you to write this on your paper there, about maybe under boast. Would you do that? It, it'll, it'll have meaning to your life at some point. If not today, may, maybe tomorrow. Write down 2 Corinthians 9.15. Because here's what your boast should be. The, see, if you save yourself, you got yourself to boast. Just like if you work and you do well, you, you have a right to boast. You have a right to, if you did your work and did it well, you have a right to boast. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not how it works in salvation at all. Not at all. All that boast is not, 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 doesn't come to man or from man about man. No, no, no one should boast. Here's what grace does. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 
there's boast. When you're saved by grace, 2 Corinthians 9, 15, the last verse of that chapter has enormous meaning. Indescribable gift. It is an indescribable gift. Now, the Greek word that Paul used in, second, in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is doron with a definite article. Normally, Paul would use charisma for giving a gift or a present. Do, doron, what does it mean, Ron? It means to give a gift or a present on a specific occasion, like uh, a birthday, anniversary, Christmas. They're grace gifts, a doron. And he uses it with that idea. What's the occasion he's talking about? Salvation. Or we might say birth. You've been born again. So even the word doron is kind of special to Paul. He used this in Romans 5.15 as a free, not a fee gift, but a free. It should be F-R-E-E, -E, a free gift. And, and what he's talking about is a something on occasion that has importance. Well, wh where, when did you get that? Well, I got it as an anniversary, my 30th anniversary or something. It is a free gift. It is a present that's given on a specific occasion as a gift. It is interesting. The Dorian grace gifts are many in the Bible. I want to mention just four for you to read later on your own. The word uh, Dorian, the gift of God's salvation, like in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. The gift of Christ. Paul uses this word in Ephesians 4, 7 for the gift of Christ. In Acts 2, 38, he used it for the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 5, 17, he used it for the gift of righteousness. The list goes on. I'm just trying to show you the word dolren as a gift on a, an occasion. It's either describing the occasion or it's describing the gift for the occasion. Kind of very interesting. Paul is not an easy read, is he? If you're looking for an easy sermon today on a very simple subject, you're, <laughs> you just didn't get it. <laughs> I'm trying to make it as simple as I can make it because Paul gets really theological. He's talking about the doctrine of salvation to Christians. Mature Christians like yourself, they need to understand the ins and outs of it and why it's such a dynamic thing. Here in my conclusion idea, all human work or merit is futile, is a futile attempt, all human work and merit is a futile attempt to achieve salvation apart from faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's futile. Futile, it's futile, futile. Such things like altruistic works, religion, reform, self-motivation to live a better life in order to be saved are futile. None of that will work. Might make you feel better for a while, but it won't work. That's not salvation. That's not salvation. And let me tell you, a lot of people think they're going to heaven based on that. A lot of people that who go to church on a regular basis think they're going to go to heaven because of that. And they have been led astray from the absolute truth. They will not get you there. God sent his son the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Notice two things that won't save you, listing Ephesians 2, 8, 9. 
yourself, it must be a gift from God. Now, not your works, because the boast goes to God, it don't go to man. Those two things won't save you. And a lot of people who go to church today with a whole lot of religion are not going to go to heaven if they include those two things in their salvation. It nullifies it. You are saved by grace, not of yourself, not of works. No boast. Makes it pretty clear. Those are all negatives. They're all nots. <laughs> Romans. Paul's consistent in his theology, Romans 4, 4, and 5. Now to the one who works, his wages is not credited as favor or grace, but as what is due. But the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly... His faith is credited as righteousness, righteousness as a gift. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not in the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, self-righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's how you get saved. God does all that. <laughs> what Paul is trying to tell us, at least in my opinion, of Ephesians 2.5 when he built the bridge from 2.5 over to 2.8.9, that God will secure your salvation by his grace and will secure it in the perfect paraphrastic Greek grammar that you are saved from the point of believing the gospel for time and eternity. And your assurance should come from the scripture and not how you feel or what other people tell you. It should come from the awareness of the truth of the holy scriptures of God upon your life. So stop doubting and start believing the word of God. This is a verse that was applicable yesterday at a funeral. I'm going to give you a verse that was very much in play yesterday amidst a funeral. It comes from John, the 11th chapter, verses 25 and 26 at a similar funeral. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me, Jesus Christ, will never die. He asked a question I ask you today. Do you believe it? I should have asked that first, shouldn't I? Do you believe that? that what, that's what makes a Christian funeral like yesterday a joy to be a part of. I'm going to read it one more time because you missed it. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? Well, I'm going to tell you, Christ died so you would never have to go through it. He died so you'd never go through it. When death knocks on your door, 
It would be the most pleasant, wonderful experience you ever had in your life next to your salvation because you will go from life to life. Jesus promised it because he promised you that he has two power over two things. I am the resurrection and the life. The question is not, does he believe it? The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? I want to give a special thanks today as a pastor for an enormous job done by our church, both in the support of Stephen Bryant during his illness, his sickness, his funeral and his memorial lunch. I can't begin to tell you what, how wonderful you people are. You are magnificent. I know I don't tell you enough, but from a pastor's heart, you are. I mean, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. I thought about what Paul said to his people. It expresses the desire and the true feeling of my heart for you. For who is our hope, our joy, and our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you, congregation? In the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ is coming. For you are our joy, our glory, and our joy. I'll tell you, you are a magnificent congregation. You're the real deal. You are what the church ought to be. You do things without grumbling and complaining. You just salute and do the job, and you do it magnificently for Christ. I can't begin to tell you as a pastor how wonderful that is. To see you in full operation of grace is just the most rewarding thing that I could possibly have. And I thank you. I know the Bryant family thanks you. Words could never properly express from either of us the gratitude that the Bryant family and your pastor has for you. You do a magnificent job as a church. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you for the theology that Paul talked about saving grace. Boy, did he really do it well. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would take what little bit we've been able to get to put it on the plate for the people to chew on. The Holy Spirit would be able to bring it to full bloom health exercise in the life of the believers as they inhale and exhale it. And the Holy Spirit is able to take it into revelation in a way and enlightenment in a way that I could have never imagined when I studied it. And so I'm thankful today for that, Father. I'm thankful for it. We do pray for Winnie and the family. That family sent him off as well as could be done. He put a big footprint in our hearts and our life as a church and a community and the business world. You can't ask for more than that, Father. I am confident by the way he suffered through what he suffered, he will get the crown of life if I understand anything about the crown of life, for he wore suffering with great honor and will be crowned for it in eternity. We look forward to that day, Father, being able to be part of the cheer section as he receives his crown. We're looking to that day, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.